Good evening, everybody. Welcome into the Nittany Lions Sports Report. It's live here on Bob Long Sports. And my name's Bob Long. Alongside me, as always, Tyler Gellhouse. We got a great show coming up for you guys this evening as we break down an emotional victory on the road against the Iowa Hawkeyes. Preview the whiteout game. Speaking of emotion, college game day in the house. The media attention is there. And they're taking on a struggling Michigan team. Certainly not going to be difficult to get up for that one, but it's a game that they need to ensure that they're ready for as this Michigan team that shows up on Saturday night may not be the team that's been struggling with teams like Illinois and teams like Army leading into this game. We also have Christian Iannarone, who is our guest picker here tonight, and he's got a really interesting story, story, Tyler. He works with Lincoln Financial Field and the Man Center from an operations perspective. We're going to focus on what he does with Lincoln Financial Field and the Philadelphia Eagles. And I know he's going to have some fun stories, and he's a Penn Stater, so we're excited to get his picks as he looks to chase down Mara Long, 6-0. <laughs> Called out of the bullpen that last week. That was impressive. Week. It really was. And, and your buddy that couldn't make it, um, I wonder what his picks would have been. Yeah. Um, but he missed out on potentially some Bob Long sports gear. Um, I'm sure Mara is dying to get some if she doesn't already have it. <laughs> uh, but someone's got to try to tie her up at 6-0 across the board. It was an impressive week. And um, ironically enough, you guys had the same exact picks. So you both went 6-0, and but she did pick first, and yeah. it makes it seem like you copied her a little bit. I so. certainly might have. We will let uh, the annals of history decide that one. But we're looking forward to that. We're also going to talk about the Blitz and how it's strength versus strength this week. Michigan rushing the football, Penn State stopping the run, and the key to Penn State containing a duo of running backs at Michigan that have been very solid throughout the year. And so that's what we have going for you here this evening. Let's hop right into it. Kinnick Stadium last weekend, a night game, 7.30 on ABC, Tyler. And that was a game that, and I threw this out there to you when we were talking off air, flex the bicep type of game. One of those games where you just show that you're a little bit tougher than the other team, a little bit more ready for that moment in that hostile environment. Obviously, other factors that came into play, points being taken off the board multiple times, and you hang in there, get a few key turnovers, win that football game. An absolute statement win for Penn State, and I think fans have to come away feeling absolutely ecstatic about what they saw. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't pretty by any stretch, um, as you mentioned, Bob, but to go into Kinnick Stadium at night, um, and obviously Iowa struggled the week before at Michigan offensively. Uh, they're a very sound defensive football team. Um, but, you know, the things that – I think Penn State grew a lot from this from this experience. They're a younger team, uh, you know, Sean Clifford's second true road start. Uh, might as well call it the first true road start because the first road game was at Maryland and it was packed with Penn State fans. But, um, you know, he, he wasn't on on Saturday night, but um, – he was with his legs, which I thought was very impressive, specifically the third and ten late in the game with the fake pitch to Kane, and he took it, juked out a defender, got the first down. They ended up scoring on that drive. Noah Kane to really kind of ice the game, put it away, even though Iowa did score um, a late touchdown after that. But, yeah, it wasn't pretty, but I learned a lot about this team moving forward that, one, the defense is absolutely elite. Um, this defense is going to keep them in every game and give them a chance to win, much like they did um, Saturday night. I mean, Iowa was able to throw the ball, but they could not run the ball. Um, and, and that's Iowa football. They want to be able to run. Um, the defense showed up. Other key takeaways for me is I think that the offensive line is actually growing. Um, I think they're getting better by the game. Uh, Rashid Walker is playing very well for a redshirt freshman left tackle. Um, he was up against Epineza, who is likely a first round pick at the end of the year. He did get called with a hold. Um, I don't think it was a hold, but that's a whole other subject. But the offensive line's growing. The running game's really starting to get going with Noah Kane. Um, it was impressive, and I think that the defense, if they can keep playing like that, you might see a similar type of game on Saturday night at Penn State. Yeah, certainly. I mean, my big takeaway of that football game was Sean Clifford and his ability to summi summarize and, and get ready to go in that fourth quarter. You know, certainly I thought the first half was – a lot of what we talked about when we had a blitz segment earlier on in the year, and he was a guy who was struggling with footwork and f struggling to keep his eyes downfield as the pocket collapsed around him and give Iowa and that defensive line certainly some credit for making life difficult. That's something that we're going to see more and more maturity as time goes on with Clifford, but 
He was able to shelve what was essentially a lower than average performance in the first half, make it happen in the second half, yes, with his legs, yes, with a few big throws. And I think that's something that we're going to keep talking about because I believe that Sean Clifford is the constraining factor in Penn State's ability to go to a college football playoff this year. And I think that's that, not dire per se, but I think it's that bluntly put, that Sean Clifford playing at a level as, say, Trace McSorley in years past, this is a college football playoff team. So I take that away. Running back rotations. Noah Kane, absolutely unbelievable. Four-minute offense. How long have we talked about that, Tyler? And he is the guy to get you downhill, get you falling forward for two, two and a half always yards falls after forward. initial contact. I love that. I love that quote. They, they said about the Eagles with Jordan Howard, he always falls forward. Well, I mean, I would hope he's falling forward. I mean, um, but yeah, I think Bob, that may have been the most impressive part of the game. Actually, was um, was was Penn State's ability because you've seen it in years past where they have a lead late in the game and the other the other, the opponent gets a chance to win it and does win it, or you rely on the defense late. They iced the game after Iowa scored the touchdown uh, to make it 17-12. They kicked it deep. Penn State ran the clock out for about 2 minutes, 40 seconds. Yep. With the run game, converting on third and shorts with Noah Kane. The offensive line was was doing their job, and I think that's impressive, and I think that's going to go a long way with this with this team for this year. And It's, it's a young team, and they're, they're learning a lot right now, and it's, it should pay dividends. They've learned a lot from what I see in that Pitt game and then that Iowa game. That Iowa game, huge. Jaquan Brisker, a big interception late in the game. Able to continue to push forward as a lot of elements are collapsing around you. Not the least of which, and you said you hate to talk about it off air. I agree with you, but we need to, including officiating in that football game. And this is becoming a trend. John O'Neill and his crew have been the officiating crew for three notable Penn State football games in the last seven years. The first was 2012 against Nebraska. Nebraska on the road, right? Matt Lehman extends the ball across the pylon. More obvious, I may add, Absolutely. than the touchdown that Fryermuth scored and then got called back on on Saturday. Obvious touchdown in Lincoln, Nebraska. Changed the game. Yep. Penn State ended up losing. Penn State loses that football game because that is called a no score, and they lose 32-23. Ohio State in 2014, perhaps the more notable mm -hmm. of the two that I'm mentioning here in the past. Interception ruled on the field. Uh, it's called a, a, an interception after a review. Goes off his chest, off the ground, up into his arms. This is an Ohio State defensive back. Clear as day, very similar as this, same crew. And then, of course, the play clock running down. They kick a 49-yard field goal. Uh, thank you for remembering that one, the field goal one, because yep. not a lot of people realize that one. And that, yeah. that, and that push in the and back five have, years. It should have been uh, five, five yards. It should have been a yards. delay of game. Right. Yeah, and they didn't call it, and it was so uh, It was about two, three seconds it was delayed. That's right, yeah. two to three seconds. And the point being there, it's not a 39-yard field goal. It's a 49-yard field goal. Right. Five yards most likely takes them out of field goal range. That's a game that Penn State lost in double overtime. Double overtime, and, and Ohio State scored off the interception and obviously got three points off of the field goal that they made too. So not to go back five years, um, but Ohio State did end up winning the national championship that yes, year too, did. which is kind of ironic. With one loss in the regular yeah. season, that would have been their second. Yes, correct. Franklin did speak to the, the media today, as he always does on Tuesdays, and he said that the Big Ten did did talk. He They called the Big Ten, and it was discussed, but he wasn't going to discuss what it was about. And I just think it's it's a crime if he does any more Penn State games, um, let yeah. alone a game that could end up deciding the Big Ten East champ, playoff berth down the line. Um yeah, I don't think I don't think he should be doing any more Penn State games because I think there's a, a clear um, objective he's trying to to enforce against Penn State. Ooh, wow! You're you're saying that you're going out and saying that. I it just seems too obvious. I mean, it, how do you overturn a call like that on on Saturday night? And it's not his first time around. Put it this way. When, when they tweet before the game at Iowa who the referees are and people start texting about it and tweeting about it, like, you know you know that there's a history there. Um, you know, usually you don't really care who the ref is, but it's becoming more and more obvious that this John O'Neill guy, that Penn State fans just don't want him ref in the games because of the experience. And I don't, I don't really blame him. Um, but the fact that he overturned Frymuth's touchdown – the call in the field was a touchdown. How did they ever have enough video evidence to overturn that? You know what I mean? If yeah. the call in the field was down at the one and you don't have enough video evidence to say it's a touchdown, 
I understand that, but the, the call on the field was a touchdown. The video evidence sure as heck looked like a touchdown. Absolutely. The announcer said it. The ref that comes in, the, the former ref and the analysis says that's a touchdown. And then you say after like 10 minutes of looking at it, I mean, <laughs> he goes, oh, no, he's down at the half-yard line. Then Penn State can't get in the end zone. And then they actually – Clifford gets in and gets called back for a hold. And I guess that's what I'm thinking. Wow, like this is really – I, I just had a bad feeling about the game. Um, but I think that makes it even sweeter that Penn State pulled it off. In the right. End. I mean, if he does the Penn State-Ohio State game, that's a, you know, unfortunately that's something that Penn State's probably going to have to battle against as well. Hmm. I mean, I'm just I, saying the history The history shows. Yeah, all I, can, all I can do is lay out the facts and let folks make their own decision. Interesting, though, that you're all going there. All you have there. to do is look. I mean, just I hear Google you. it and look it up, and there's a lot of different instances. It's not just this game. That's 100% you know right. What I mean? It's just, man, that's a hey, pretty transparent people, way to go about it if that's really the issue. But people have biases. I mean, you know, whether or not he, he is from Chicago. Um, he, okay. He, well, I mean, he might be a fan or an alum of a different team in the Big Ten. Some people just don't like, like, if I'm a ref, I don't like certain schools. So, it's, so but why would, why would Nebraska – be the initial start oh, uh, point. Well, I mean, well, that's no, a no, Big no. Twelve. No, what school. I'm saying is, he might have something against Penn State. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think it's very possible based off of the history. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think I can't. I just can't go there with you. But all right. I mean, I'm just saying. I would fair not be. Enough. The, I would not be the least bit surprised. I don't know what it is, but for whatever reason, people people don't like Penn State, and that's fine. I mean, not everybody does. But I, it's usually not lead referees for. Uh, but how do you how do you judge that though? I mean, what do they I do? Usually, lie detector tests? I, I mean, usually don't. I would. I mean, I'm going to give them hey the man. benefit of the doubt. Well, I can't believe that's I'm your defending decision. Him. Here I, I am defending. I'm, I'm telling you, this is not where I expected this to go. Uh, this is good stuff. Well, I, it's a shame we're talking about a referee right now with with the game that just happened and the and the game coming up on Saturday. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's been a topic of discussion, um, really, really since the game ended till still now with with uh, Penn State fans. So my and my other big takeaway, you talked about the offensive line. Let's talk about it. Rashid Walker going up one on one against AJ Epineza was a great experience for him as a redshirt freshman. Epineza, I think, as build, he was tremendous and a very difficult matchup that's going to be difficult for anybody mm -hmm. he plays against all year long. So I thought he did a tremendous job, and I think Walker. Certainly learned a few things going up against him, able to understand how a high-level defensive end is going to work. Yep. I think that's only going to pay dividends yeah, as the year exactly. goes on. You're going to see Chase Young at Ohio State later in the season. He, uh, yeah, Rasheed Walker, I mean, the Big Ten has a lot of good pass rushers, and he was up He was up for it. And that Epineza, and I'm probably butchering his name, um, but he likely is a first-round pick coming out this year as a junior. Um, he's, he's thought of very similarly as Gross Matos is at Penn State. Held his, the whole O-line really held their own. I mean, the first two plays of the game, the sacks, the first two out of three, it was really on Clifford for holding the ball too long. Um, on the one play, he actually had Hamler coming across um, wide open. Um, you know, I think he was a little bit happy feet and um, deer in the headlights to start. And he did yep. settle down. He didn't play great by any stretch, um, at least through the air. But um, the O-line, and that's why I'm glad, because earlier in the year, um, especially the pick game, I'm like, what these guys are like regressing. But really, honestly, they have improved every week. Um, the right guards, uh, Miranda and, and Thorpe, are still rotating. Yeah, I believe Thorpe played. Um, Miranda played fifty-five percent of the snaps. Thorpe played forty-five. Um, Minette has been steady. Eddie at center, um, and then Gonzalez is playing well at left guard. And then and then Will Fry is, is is much improved over at right tackle. I mean, it, the line is quietly becoming a strength of this offense now, which is great because the line drives the bus. The line drives the bus. I like that one. I don't know that I've heard that one explicitly stated that way before. The line drives the bus. Yeah, I, I mean, we talk a lot about this Penn State game against uh, Iowa, and I think we talked leading into it about how difficult the environment was going to be. I think it lived up to it. Iowa yeah. fans brought it. Penn State hung in there really well. P.J. Mustafer, a, a good job to dislodge a ball. Yep. That ball may not have necessarily been clean to begin with, but it didn't Mustafer look like it, getting but he, into he the broke backfield, it. Yeah, right. that's a big part of it. Gross Matos was in there as well. And our boy and Bruce Badgley's boy, Jan Johnson, coming up with the fumble recovery. Uh, well, how right about, place, ha, right ha, time. I got to give Robert Windsor a shout-out, too. Oh uh, he's goodness. been under the radar a lot this year. Um, 
54 on Penn State was a monster on the D line. His and, best game is a Nittany line. Yeah, uh, by far. I mean, he even if he wasn't getting the Stanley in time on the Brisker interception, he knocked him out um, right before he threw it. I mean, he was all over the place. I mean, this D line is like the real deal. I mean, and the defense is is phenomenal, but the D line is really getting good push um, from every from every position. Um, but you know what's so funny too about the game is seventeen to twelve. You look at it, oh, really close game. Well, it didn't feel like that though necessarily until Noah Kane scored that last touchdown. It kind of when we went up seventeen six, it kind of felt iced. But really, Penn State should have had twenty one points. Um, and I I said before the game I thought if they could score twenty points that would be enough to win, and they didn't. But it was still enough to win. So it right. just goes to show how good that defense is. And and also we haven't talked about it either, but. Blake Gillikin, I thought was probably his best game as a Penn Stater punting. Iowa had pretty much horrible field position the whole night. He was uh, awarded Big Ten Special Teamer of the Week, so congrats there. Um, you know, special teams really play a big role in those kind of games. There's no doubt about that. And Gillikin was huge. Setting up that field position, as you mentioned, against an offense in Iowa that already has trouble moving the football – Penn State's defense was tremendous. Listen, it's exactly what you expected in a Penn State-Iowa game. A game that Iowa, I thought, actually controlled things throughout most of the first half, and Penn State kind of took advantage as they got into the second half. The speed started to play that difference in a role. Clifford makes a couple decent throws. Frankly, I thought K.J. Hamler, oh. it's either a touchdown or a pick six, and it was just yeah, beyond the arms of that linebacker. First, yeah. But – you, you get the ball into his hands, and he makes he, an athletic play. It's it, as simple it, as that. And so you get two or three of those in a game, you're putting up near 20 points, you win most football games. Yep. I came away very impressed with Iowa from a defensive standpoint. I came away very impressed with Kinnick Stadium, generally speaking, and I came away very impressed with the Penn State Nittany Lions. And if you're a Penn State fan – you're leaving that game from the stadium or you're turning off your television thinking it's a good day to be a Nittany Lion. That team showed well on national television. They earned themselves another chance to play on national television and to have game day yeah. come to Happy Valley. And here you are through game one of the three-game slog, and you're tailing game three, Michigan State, a team that can't put a point on the board, it seems like, these days. So you're really lining this game up against Michigan – as that brunt that you need to get to and then begin to cascade through the rest of the season leading into a game against Ohio State, it's a decent day to be a Nittany Lion. Yeah, at the beginning of the year, this three-game gauntlet looked um, it looked pretty terrifying um, because you know going to Iowa is never easy, no matter what kind of team they have, especially at night. Um, they 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 did they passed their test there. Michigan isn't really they're still a very very good football team. But they're not what many people thought they were going to be at the beginning of the year. The offense hasn't been there. Uh, the defense is still very good. But the offense isn't clicking like many people thought it was going to take them to the next level. And and Penn State hasn't had great success recently either with Michigan State. Um, you know, last year was a heartbreak loss towards the end. I think Michigan State scored like 30 seconds left to win the game. The year before was the weekend after Penn State had the heartbreak loss at the Horseshoe and 2017 and they went out to Michigan State and had about what the three hour yep. weather delay lost that game so you know people kind of you can't forget that kind of thing and and Michigan State's a well coached team uh, they have a lot back from last year but right now um, you know Michigan and Michigan State from the beginning of the season looking at the schedule it's kind of changed to what they are now and all of a sudden Penn State's sitting there obviously focused on Michigan but you're thinking, wow, we could win all three of these games, have the bye week after that before then going to Minnesota, who is undefeated right now, um, but doesn't have the strength of schedule. But you can be going into that second bye week undefeated, which would be setting you up perfectly for the final stretch. Um, so it, it's it, they're in a good spot right now, but if they take care of business on Saturday night, I mean, th that Michigan State game, I think they're going to be rolling two too well to be stopped by Michigan State at that point. So let's get into this next week's opponent. College game day in the house, Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Penn State against Michigan, a team that has struggled. Army took them to overtime. They lost badly to Wisconsin. 
And then even this past weekend, after jumping to a 28-0 lead against Illinois, Illinois ripped off 25 straight points in the third quarter. Backup quarterback, too. And Michigan had to run away with it with two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. They ran and hid and won by those 17 points. What we've seen from Michigan is a little bit of back and forth at the running back position. Their stud is a true freshman, Zach Charbonnet, who ran for 116 yards on 18 carries last week against Illinois. And Hassan Haskins is a sophomore. He takes some carries as well. Kind of that two-headed monster. Now, Charbonnet did not play much in games two and three for Michigan. It was a little thought about a lingering injury. They talked about load management, essentially. For the last two games, he's gotten over 10 carries, and he's been the feature back. Penn State, I think, is going to see him in a big way this coming weekend, and it's going to be strength against strength. We'll break it down on the whiteboard shortly as well. The rushing attack of Michigan, eight straight runs to open the game, over 200 yards in the first half on the ground, and Haskins and Charbonnet, the one-two punch there, accounting for about 250 yards combined. How is Penn State's defensive line going to keep up? This year, they've been fantastic. And this year, Michigan has had success against defenses that don't have the brawn and the brunt up front. Charbonnet ran for 100 yards against Army. He ran for 118 against Illinois. Another 125 for Haskins against Illinois. Wisconsin, different story. Big-time struggle. So I want to see what this Penn State defense is going to do, but certainly the track record is there, even in small sample sizes this year. The better the defenses get, the more they need to open up the playbook for Shane for Shea Patterson to chuck the ball deep. And normally, that's where things go awry for Michigan. The other thing, Tyler, 17 fumbles on the year for this Michigan team. Nine of them lost. That's a that's whole a lot, lot wow. for six football games. Oh, my God. Wow. Um, I didn't realize they fumbled that much. But uh, you bring up a great point, as always, Bob, with their rushing attack. I mean, that – that's kind of like what Michigan has been under Harbaugh, and they brought Josh Gaddis in from Alabama previously at Penn State to kind of revamp this Michigan offense. They wanted to do more spread, get the athletes the ball in space. It just really hasn't – I don't know if it's a personnel thing, but it really hasn't worked out well this year. Um, Shea Patterson, I think, has kind of regressed. Um, I'm not sure if he really took off like Michigan thought he would as a quarterback. Uh, he was a former number one recruit years ago, and he went to Ole Miss to start. But, you know, I think that it, it is a good matchup for Penn State being Michigan's going to want to run the ball. Penn State's not giving up much running at all this year. Um, and, and especially in that in Penn State's home environment at, at night, white out. It's going to be – it should be tough, um, you know, if they can stop the run – and try to force Patterson to beat them with their arm, I think they're in good shape. I certainly think so, too. So when I look at Michigan's defense, they're a team that over the years has prided themselves on getting to the quarterback. Certainly Winovich and Gary and those guys have, have left the program, though Gary didn't play a ton last year with injury, obviously. Uh, this is a different team. It's a younger defense. Certainly still some great corners that are going to make things difficult on Penn State. But I think the answer for Penn State is to establish the run. And that can be running through the tackles with Noah Kane. That could be getting Journey Brown in space. That could even be Ricky Slade out of the backfield catching the football. Don't rule that out of the right. equation for that particular skill set that he brings and I think an ability to work this Michigan defense and find some openings within it. But I think that's going to be the start of things for Penn State, not the least of which we have yet to see Sean Clifford against a high-profile FBS Division One, Big Ten, ACC-type defense. Besides Pitt and Iowa, he has been unbelievable. Against Iowa and against Pitt, there have been Seven, struggles 17 there. points in both each game. games, and, but they won both because of the defense. They won both so. because of the defense. But I think that you're going to see Ricky Ronnie commit to the run early, and from a Sean Clifford perspective, they're going to work him in, I would think, with easier routes, little yeah. curls, hitches, crossing routes, maybe some rub action, mm -hmm. and ability to get guys open and throw some underneath passes. Well, that's actually what I, I thought they should have been doing against Iowa, and I believe six out of their five out of their first six plays at Iowa were passes. And I just didn't think that was a good idea because you could tell that Clifford was nervous. Um, you know, it was his first big road Big Ten start. I mean, he's redshirt sophomore. 
Um, he did settle in, but um, you know, I think the run game is quarterback's best friend. He's going to be nervous again on Saturday night. I mean, it's only human nature to be in that kind of environment at the very beginning to be a little a little nervous. Um, after a while, it's just another game. But, um, you know, I think it's important to establish that run early on, no matter who the running back is. But, but and, and let the line know, you know, the offensive line. That means a lot when you come out and start run blocking and you're getting first downs. It's going to start to build confidence, and they're going to, they could wear them down, the Michigan D-line, by the end of the game. And, I, and it's going to open up the pass like you just mentioned as well. One more note, and I'm not a huge betting guy, but uh, I saw a statistic out there that in Penn State's last eight night games – they have covered the spread by an average of 13.3 points. Wow. Now, again, a 42-13 to 13 win against Michigan, they may cover that, let's just say it was a four-point spread, yeah. by 25 points. Right. Right? Right. And so that is obviously a misnomer. And last year against Ohio State, certainly they covered, but that didn't feel good for anybody. Mm -mm. Uh, but it's worth noting, Penn State – is in the game or plays extremely well at whiteout contests. Now, it's tough to really gauge that the last eight when these players have been here for a max of now five years. So you really can't draw anything from the game eight years ago well, or even, whether it was six he, years ago, how many ever night games you have in a year. Even when they had the um, scholarship reductions, I mean, the whiteout was still always a close game. I mean, yep. we talked about it earlier with Hackenberg and quarterback and the interception and double overtime. I mean – Still, that was kind of the beginning of things yeah, for Franklin. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's always um, – you're right. It's always a close close game. If Penn State's a heavy underdog, they usually make it a very close game. And um, I think they're actually one game below 500 whiteouts, but it's a little skewed because of the scholarship oh, yeah. reductions, which obviously is tough to overcome. And Who is this? Franklin is um, under – I believe it's Penn State in whiteout games. Don't quote Since me on ever? it. Since um, ever? I believe I saw that they were 7-8. and eight. And I can look that They've up. They've only when you had go, 15 years well, worth of whiteout games? The first whiteout was a student section whiteout right. against Ohio State. In 2005? 2005. Yeah, okay. Then that would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah 15 years. That's pretty much how math works. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I don't have to look it up so, after all. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The only thing I'll say about that is it's always the top team on your schedule. The yeah. toughest game of the year. Mm-hmm. And most likely games that you otherwise wouldn't be favored in. Perhaps this year is something different, but last year against Ohio State would count. Sure. Certainly three years ago against Ohio State would count. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget whether Penn State was even favored against Michigan when they Allen beat Allen Robinson had that well, yep, game. Yeah, there was that game yeah. as well. So, I mean, that that's the math behind that. Seven and eight, I actually think, is a somewhat impressive record given the competition that you're going to face. And given the circumstances that Penn State was dealing with at the time the of a couple of those. Yeah, so. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. So anything further on Michigan? We're going to talk about them at the whiteboard in just a few minutes, but anything else that you have? I, I mean, this is – even though Michigan is ranked 16, um, he, this is still a very good team that should not be overlooked by, obviously, the team, Penn State team, or fans, um, you know, getting a little excited after the Iowa win, which was which was obviously a very flexure muscle kind of game. Um they're still very good. They're, they have talent across the board. I mean, it's not like this is going to be a cakewalk, even though Penn State's eight-and-a-half-point favorites right now. I mean, Harbaugh is a very good coach. To Most people view him as a very good coach. I think he's a very good coach, but he struggles against the ranked teams, um, especially on the road. And um, I forget what his record is against top ten teams or something, but I don't even know if he has a win yet against a top ten team. But – they're they're hungry and they're they're still in the race just as much as Ohio State and Penn State are right now. You're right about so, that. So I mean it's it's we're at the halfway point and it's not like they're just gonna roll over. I mean, they think that they still have a chance. They run the table, they're in. So if they run the you table, know what I mean? they are in. Yeah, because, I mean they have Notre Dame next week. Well um, well be okay. I was thinking Big Ten championship but no, because even so, their loss was right. to the team out west. Sure. Wisconsin. Yeah, right? so, so and, and they you would know have they get Ohio right State there. at the end of the year at home. Um, and they're due for a win against Ohio State. I mean, it's got to come sooner or later, you'd think. But, I mean, this is going to be a hungry Wolverine team that, you know, they have something to prove. They think the Wisconsin game was a fluke and Army. So, it'll be interesting. Wisconsin and Army were a fluke. And Illinois. What? We shall see. That's probably what they're thinking. Yep. And and listen, that's not – Because Harbaugh, Harbaugh did say 
um, recently. I don't know if it was before, after the Iowa game where they put up 10 points. He says, we're starting to hit our stride offensively, which I thought was kind of weird. You're like, we're starting to hit our stride, but you just had 10 points. But then they did come out and have a good offensive game against Illinois. But They did. They played really good first, second, and fourth quarter. Illinois is no Penn State on defense either. That's right. So. And if they take off that time in the third quarter, it's it's not going to go well for but them. But I mean, but they do have athletes specifically at wide receiver: Donovan Peoples Jones, Ronnie Bell, um, Tyreek Black. I mean, they do have yep. athletes out there, which is they want to get them the ball in space. It just hasn't really worked out the way they wanted to so far. So, uh, Penn State's defense has to be ready though. Still to come on the Nittany Lions Sports Report here, Bob Long, Tyler Gellhouse. We have the Blitz where we go to the whiteboard and break down one aspect of Penn State football that either was key the prior week or will be key the next week. This week, we're going to talk about Michigan running attack, Penn State's run-stopping defense, and how it's going to be strength against strength and what to look for. Then we have Christian Iannarone coming on thereafter for the guest picker segment. We're going to tell some great stories from the gridiron of sorts, as he is an operations manager for the Penn, uh, the uh, wow Penn State Philadelphia Eagles on game day, game day operations staff member, and he sees everything from what you see on the field to kind of the crevices of the stadium from sun up to sun down from a, a game day perspective. So excited to get that background and of course get his picks. You're watching the Nittany Lions Sports Report. It's live here on Bob Long Sports. Dunphy Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation, our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want with financing you need. Dunphy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dumpy difference. You'll be glad you did. Welcome back inside the Nittany Lions Sports Report. It's live here on Bob Long Sports. Bob Long, Tyler Gale House. Now it's time to go to the Blitz, where we go to the whiteboard and break down one key aspect of Penn State football. And today, as we preview the Michigan game, it's about Michigan and their strength and that is the tailback position. Zach Charbonnet, a true freshman running back who has come in and taken a big load of carries. Hassan Haskins is a secondary back that I think we're going to see a lot of rushes from as well. But Charbonnet has had as many as 33 carries in one game. That was in the opener against Army. And they needed every one of them as he ran for 100 yards and they took down the Black Knights in overtime, 24-21. Now, what Charbonnet is able to do well, he has this blend of being able to get in between the tackles, but also being able to bounce it to the outside. You know, he's that Michigan back, though, and Michigan is one of those teams that uh, is very, very talented from an offensive line perspective. This year is no different. Up front, they have big boys that have been decimating for defenses that have been, let's call them of a slightly lower tier than Penn State or what they saw against Iowa a few weeks back. Certainly, Wisconsin was able to keep Michigan's defense in check. I'm sorry, Michigan's offense in check as well. So now my key here for Penn State is we talk about a 6-0 and football team. We talk about Tony who's able to get to the quarterback, Gross Matos who can slide to the inside or can get around a, defense, a uh, right tackle to the outside. We talk about Robert Windsor, who had his best game as a Nittany Lion. Fred Hansard, who can be in there. Antonio Shelton, the starter. P.J. Mustafer provides depth. This defense has been unbelievable against the run. Micah Parsons and Jan Johnson here can also add that run-blocking ability. So this front seven, as strong as Penn State has seen in, in some time. Michigan... They ran the ball eight times to start the game against Illinois and 200 yards in the first half. So the unstoppable force meets the immovable object. Who's going to win? And I think that's going to be a key and the key for Penn State defensively to keep Michigan off the board offensively. Nobody's saying that this Michigan offense is an offense that can light it up down the field. Shea Patterson has really struggled. Yes, the weapons are out there, but I think Penn State from an ability to get pressure and certainly what we've seen from the John Reeds of the world, the Tariq Castro Fields of the world, and we've seen some great play from Garrett Taylor 
at strong at uh, at free, and then both Brisker and Lamont Wade at strong. I think they're going to be able to keep them in check. But the pressure consistently will be Zach Charbonnet, I think, getting the majority of the carries, and Haskins being that second option to try to bounce it to the outside, that one-two punch that Michigan's going to count on. And if you can start to chip some of these safeties and cornerbacks and keep these linebackers in the middle of the box, that's going to create room in the middle of the field for a guy in Shea Patterson who has really struggled, but you give him weapons and you give him some open field. Even something like Shea Patterson struggling can be nixed by some openings in the defense, and that's what you saw in the second half of that Illinois game, specifically the fourth quarter. So that's my key here. Penn State, one of the best rushing defenses in the country. Okay, now is the time to show it. You have a team in Michigan that is going to be committed to running the ball in between, in between this A-gap, to pulling this guard from the left side and running off tackle. This is an athletic offensive line. Don't get it wrong here. This Michigan offensive line, though the team is struggling, is a strength, will continue to be a strength. We saw last year at the Big House, Penn State had immense problems stopping the run, among other things. And so this is my key here for this game. Yes, a new year. Yes, some new personnel. Yes, the roles have been flipped. It's Penn State hosting the game. It's Penn State number six in the country. It's Michigan reeling with a tough loss. Okay, all that's changed. What's going to happen here right down the line of scrimmage? That's obviously the key to this game for me and a Michigan team that's not afraid to run it in any down in any situation. I mentioned eight times to start the football game. They'll do it till it doesn't work anymore. And it's the Penn State front seven that has to make it not work. That's the Blitz here for today. We'll take a break, come back on the other side. Christian Iannarone is our guest in our guest picker segment this evening here on the Nittany Lions Sports Report. I chose CCM because I have found that this company um, on the – level of scaling that we have here, the volume that we are doing, to truly have every department head and employee fully engaged in the mission of the company to make it an originator focused, uh, production first uh, company. I have not found that anywhere I've worked and I've worked at one of the largest banks in the world, down to the smallest tiny community bank and correspondent lender. No one has been able to consistently deliver that message. Welcome back inside the Nittany Lions Sports Report. Live here on Bob Long Sports, and we have our guest picker here for the evening, Christian Iannarone, and he is an operations game day operations manager with the Philadelphia Eagles in Lincoln Financial Field. So we thought that was a pretty cool story to Come on and get your, your thoughts on. Obviously, uh, not your, your day-to-day. I know you work in pharma, but uh, a pretty cool way to stay associated with the team you love, the Philadelphia Eagles, on a day-to-day basis, on a game day by game day basis, that is. Absolutely, Bob. Thank you for uh, having me on the show. Um, yep, so, uh, you know, it's great being able to work for an organization you love, um, support, obviously, the Eagles and uh, Penn State, as I am an alumni from Penn State. So it's good to be able to kind of talk on your show and uh, be able to tell you a little bit about my uh, my day-to-day stuff. Tyler, I know you had an, an opening thought here for Christian. I, I do have a question for him, um, and it doesn't have anything to do with me getting tossed from the link that we, disc- <laughs> we discussed beforehand. Um, but... Going to Penn State, obviously I'm sure you went to the Penn State games when you were a student there, now working with the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I see a big difference in the atmosphere between the two, um, an NFL atmosphere and a college football atmosphere. Can you talk about a little bit um, some of the atmosphere changes, differences that you see between a game at Beaver Stadium and a game at Lincoln Financial Field? I mean, from the past few years since I started two years ago, and uh, they didn't give me a ring, but we can, we can discuss that later. I think the atmosphere is uh, very similar when it comes down to um, your college experience versus your professional experience. I think the I think that there's definitely higher run games, more passing, um, but I think that the crowd and the atmosphere inside the facility is um, just as intense in both situations. 
it just might be a younger crowd. <laughs> yeah, well, that's like the thing about like college, which I I like. I like the the band and you know um, oh, the yes. student sections and exactly. and I think it's I think it's a more interesting like a lively crowd. Not to say that Lincoln Financial gets rowdy, it does, but college football to me, like especially what you're going to see on Saturday night at Penn State. I mean, there's really. Not much in all of sports that can compare to some sort of setting like that. No, absolutely not. A big, a big ten, you know, Michigan State whiteout game or Michigan game. It, it's it doesn't compare. But obviously, the birds are uh, a powerful team, and uh, hopefully, in the future, we're gonna continue to uh, grow the franchise with players like Miles Davis or no, <laughs> Miles Sanders. Miles Sanders. <laughs> If peeing your pants is cool, consider yeah, right, Miles, Miles Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Miles. Yeah, Miles Sanders. Um, yeah, but uh, so yeah. So I wanted to ask you about some of the crazy stories that you may that are obviously PC enough for our show, mm. but uh, any crazy stories that you've seen from your time associated with game day with the Eagles that. Uh, Let's just say an Eagles fan may be interested to know. I mean, there's definitely some wild times. Um, I think the best was the uh, the band fan who won the 50-50, um, who ended up in the lobby of uh, the place quite uh, uncovered and uh, revealing, oh to say the least. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that, that had to be one of the most crazy times. It's just another <laughs> adventure every, every day. <laughs> I mean... Have you met um, any cool celebrities, athletes? Uh, obviously, a lot of Philadelphia athletes go to the games. I know you're in operations. I don't know if behind the scenes you've met or have seen anybody, you know, famous celebrity athlete type of thing. Depends. I mean, each day I'll uh, I'll run into a few of the executives. Mm -hmm. um, I met Lori. I met um, okay. Don. Cool. Don's always on the sideline giving me the eye because I'm always in the wrong spot watching yeah. the beginning, the practices. Um, but uh, – I try to get a little bit uh, like interaction with mm -hmm. them. Um, obviously, the players every once in a while I'll walk around. Cheerleaders are right there. It's it's nice. it's, it's a great experience. Cool. I, I love uh, just being part of an organization like Penn State. I can support and hopefully uh, continue to kind of grow there. That's awesome. Hmm. Uh, from a perspective of working a game. Oh. What I mean, what is that like? And most people would never have any idea what's that like. So when does your day start? Uh, what's the first thing you do when you get to the stadium? What's the least uh, favorite thing that you have to do? I mean, walk us through, if you could, what a day in the life is. Absolutely. Uh, we have a lot of different opportunities with the Eagles. I specifically work on their op side when it comes down to the fan experience. Um, a lot of the time I'll be running around game balls that are signed to uh, your long-term season ticket holders, mm -hmm. that side of things, making sure your high value client is basically catered to. Um, but it's, it's a long day. You're up at eight o'clock in the morning before the game starts, uh, making sure that things are, uh, in place and ticketing's running well and just going from there. But, um, yeah, it's it's just a new experience every day. <laughs> do, do you get to, do you get to watch uh, most of the game? I mean, I'm I'm around, around the stadium, running around with balls. Uh, it depends on the game. I mean, I'm maybe catching. seeing here and there, but exactly. definitely not like the normal fans watching. It's, it's definitely not the the normal fan right. um, experience. Um, but uh, obviously, we do watch the games together mm -hmm. on the uh, off games and the away games and stuff like that. Cool, so. sure. But, uh, yeah, it's a lot of running around. Um, I'll be in and out watching a little bit of the lower level, just, you know, around. <laughs> <laughs> around trying to make sure your your back is away from the field, although the back should probably be to the field most oh, of the yes. time. But oh, you yes. find a way to sneak some peeks at the game. and Exactly. But, you know, I mean, you catch up on the games, watch the highlights, make sure you didn't miss anything too exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what got you into it? Uh, Penn State football, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you know, Penn State was my team. I only got into them when I started um, at Penn State in uh, 2007. But, uh, you know, watching uh, all, like, the Big Ten and that mm -hmm. side of things, it kind of just was a natural progression to love the Eagles and there get into go. football. So Nice. So you were at Penn State certainly during an interesting time. Was there any – 
um, either notable, good or bad, you know, any, any favorite moments of yours while you were there at Penn State from a football perspective? From a football standpoint, I think that, like, Paterno uh, during his last year uh, – coaching was would always walk by my one class in in buki and uh it was always cool because everybody would pop up on the glass and like, <laughs> wave to him and he he was just he would walk by and um he was always a nice guy you know um very kind to the students and everybody like bob said we have five games to pick um the first game of the week that we'll be picking head to head is oregon at washington both ranked teams in the pac-12 oregon Comes in around 13, and Washington just getting in the rankings at 25. So, Oregon at Washington. I'm going to have to go with the Ducks here. Um, I think that uh, Washington's definitely struggled in the red zone this year. Um, but, you know, the Oregon, even though they lost to Auburn early, it was early in the season. So, I think we're okay with that. Um, and I think their D is going to shut them down. Love the stats. Love that it. is fantastic. He, he sounds like Corso. It's great. Yes, he does. Did you bring your headgear? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He brought his Eagles yeah, hat. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Got to support the Eagles. <laughs> Chip Kelly, Oregon Duck. And I, like, no. I like Washington. Do I like, you really? Yep. Wow. Husky Stadium. At home. Yeah, tough it. place to play. I do like the concept of Jacob Eason. Um, whether the execution will be there is a little bit different, but I do like this Washington team. I think to pull a minor upset here. Um, I'm going Oregon. Um, yeah, I think that they're actually probably the Pac-12's best team outside of that loss to uh, Auburn, who's a very good team, obviously, in week one. Um, I think they're going to start to hit their stride a little bit here and make a run um, at the Pac-12 championship. I'm going, I'm going Oregon um, over Washington. Um, our next game, we're kind of – We've been having a lot of pickums with Temple this year, and they've all been great games to do pickums with. Actually, they they did beat Memphis last week at the tough Lincoln Financial Field, as we joked about for them on Saturdays. Now they travel on the road to take on SMU in a conference game. SMU is also is ranked uh, right now, um, so we have Temple at SMU. I think this is a difficult one, um, but I think the Owls are going to pull it off. Um, you know, in reality, they both teams their numbers really line up. Their pass uh, pass yardage is close. They're both around like the 300 mark. Uh, the rush uh, offense is also around the same thing. So you're not looking at a very different. There have been very high scoring games with both teams. Um, I think it's going to come down to the quarterbacks, and I like Russo. There you wow. go. Going with Temple, huh? How nice. about that? I'm going to stick to my tried and true method. Temple at home, whoever they're playing, when it's on the road. If they're on the road at SMU, traveling down to Dallas, give me the Mustangs. Yeah, I'm going Mustangs too. Um, undefeated, ranked 19, ranked for the first time, I think, since the death penalty um, that they had back whenever that was. But, yeah, Temple is a different team away from home. Uh, I think it's going to be – a good game for about three quarters, and then I expect SMU to pull away with a comfortable win. Uh, probably by about 10 points if I had to guess, but I am going SMU. Our next game is also a Pac-12 showdown. Um, Arizona State uh, travels to Utah to take on the Utes. Uh, and this is ranked versus ranked. I just don't – it's not loading. But uh, Arizona State on the road taking on Utah. I think uh, Arizona has been very competitive uh, this season. The uh, last four games, they've only been down really by seven points each game. So I think they really do have the opportunity to shine here. But ultimately, I think Utah is going to take it over because their defense is dominant. So I'm going with uh, Utah over Arizona. Take the Southern Cal game out of the equation, and Utah is – a top five football team in college football. You think so, huh? They have been so impressive in the games that were not on the road at the Coliseum. And I think that continues, especially at home. I'm going to keep up hmm. the home teams. The home teams are going to carry the day this weekend. Utah wins this one over Arizona State. I'm, uh, this is the one, the first game we've all agreed on, actually. I'm going to go Utah as well. Arizona State. They are um, they are undefeated, I believe. Um, no, they got one loss. Do they have they? one loss? But they do. I'm sorry. But they've had a couple of 
really close game that they squeaked out uh, last week against uh, Washington State at home. Michigan State a couple weeks a couple weeks back on the road. I think they they did lose to Colorado by three, which is a really bad loss actually. Um, but I think with a freshman quarterback going into Utah. I don't see it happening. I think that they pick up their second loss on the year, and I think Utah comes out with the win there as well. Um, Baylor at Oklahoma State, Big 12 game, um, and this game is in Stillwater, Oklahoma, so the the uh, Cowboys will be home. So uh, Baylor 6-0, and right? Yes, they are. Yes, yes. I think after that big win against uh, Texas Tech, Baylor is definitely going to be able to uh, climb on top of this one. So I'm going Baylor with field goal. I have already lost my shirt twice with Baylor, picking against them. I, I, <laughs> so, when you're in a hole, you keep digging. Damn right. We got Oklahoma State in Stillwater coming up with an upset against ranked and undefeated Baylor. And I will go down dying on that hill I, if I need I to. Think I'm, I think I'm right there with you. <laughs> I, I, I don't see it with this Baylor team, but they're winning. Um I don't think anybody really had any kind of high hopes, high expectations for them this year. Oklahoma State has a really, really good running back and a guy named Chubba Hubbard, also one of the coolest names in college football. Chubba, um, Chubba Hubbard. Yeah. Uh, cool. <laughs> I, I think that uh, the games in Stillwater, I mean, home field advantages in football are a big deal, especially college. Um, I think Oklahoma State's going to win, just like Bob said. Um, neither of us have been – Big have been big fans of Baylor, uh, especially with our picks, and they keep um, proving us wrong. But we're going to keep digging there, Bob. They keep it digging. I think it's going to turn our way this week. And the final game, we're going to go to the ACC. A struggling Florida State takes on what was an undefeated Wake Forest team that suffered their first loss last week to Louisville in an absolute shootout. So the Seminoles travel to uh, Wake Forest to take on the Demon Deacons. I think I got to go uh, Wake Forest here. Just a gut. I, and this isn't directed at you, I would have said this even if you picked Florida State. How can you trust Wake Forest? <laughs> How can you possibly, sorry, not you again, pick, <laughs> pick Wake Forest? That was my first thought when I thought about this. But then you look at the game, and, and they're 5-1, and one, and Florida State is just brutal. I, I have no reason for this pick other than it's a brand pick. I think of Florida State as a football program. I do not think of Wake Forest as a football program. And so this is going to be the first game that I'm not picking a home team, but I'm picking a brand, picking Florida State down as they are, picking them to beat Wake Forest. I was so close of of doing that too, just based off of the brand. Um, Until I saw that it's it's a night game uh, just now. It's 730. Not that Wake Forest is like, what colors are the benches at Wake Forest what Stadium? Do you know? The benches? Oh I want to say who that. Who knows that? I don't know, but you'll find out when you watch on Saturday oh. night. Oh, why? Because nobody's there. I, okay, I got you. All right. <laughs> I got you now. I thought, you were, I thought you were talking about the benches on the sideline. No, but you're right. Oh. But I don't. Florida State is just a mess. I mean, Taggart is probably going to get fired at the end of the season. I just think the dumpster fire continues. I'm going to take Wake Forest to win the game um, at home. Nice little bounce back win, um, Demon Deacons. And uh, the pick you guys have all been waiting for, Penn State right now coming in at eight and a half point favorites against the Wolverines, Saturday night, 7.30. State College, Pennsylvania, whiteout conditions are expected. Penn State, eight and a half point favorites. Are you taking them to cover? Are you not? Give us a score, please. Another uh, another tight one here. Um, I think it's really a toss up. You've got two very similar teams. Um, you have team like both Michigan and Penn State both have similar advantages and disadvantages as a team. I think that um, ultimately it's going to come down to who controls the ball uh, and who's going to convert and carry on those third down opportunities. I think that you. Um, your quarterback situation is going to make a huge difference in this game. I think Patterson's due for a big game, but um, Clifford, he needs to step it up. And if he, if he can step it up for this big opportunity, I think that Iowa was a big step. Um, but you've also seen, um, what's it called? Like big momentum in, uh, when it comes down to uh, your receiving out of uh, Hamler. So mm-hmm. I think that um, – 
I think it's just going to come down your pass run offense and who's going to be able to hit the uh, opportunities. And I think it's going to go down to uh, it being a huge deal in Happy Valley, but I don't think they'll cover the spread. And what do you think the score is going to be? I think it's going to be 14-13 Penn State. Oh, my God. I think it's going to be a really close game. Low Low scoring. scoring. Oh, my God. Very low scoring, You could very well be right on that. Wow. So I am fortunate to... A win's a win, though. Yes, absolutely. Throw the spread out the door. Forget the spread. I have been fortunate to have picked every Penn State game correctly against the spread this year. Uh, Pitt? Mm. What was the... Pitt spread was a lot more than what they won by. And I'm pretty sure I... I thought Chris was the only one that's... Who was week two? Give me one second, because I'm pretty sure... I thought we have been picking Penn State to cover. Chris was week two, and he, he said that Penn State would not cover, and he yeah. was right. And I picked... No, 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 he didn't. No, no, he was not right. Oh, yes, he was. No, he wasn't. Yes, he was. Go we're, back and watch it after this. We'll watch it after this. We're going to have to go figure this we're gonna out. We're going to watch it after this, and you're going to open up. 45 And you're going to open, you're gonna gonna open up a statement next week. Next week is you're going to be your opening statement that you were wrong, but go ahead. Okay. All right, we'll that take your word good. for it, but we'll go ahead. We'll take our word for it now, and we'll readdress next week. That said, <laughs> I hope I'm right, by the way. If not, I'm going to look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> You're starting with the statement. Uh, yeah, I, okay. strug- I struggle with this one because 10 points would cover, right? And that, and that could be a close game. It could be Pinnaker adding a field goal on late. But there's something to me that scares me about this football game. And what it is is the fact that Michigan has struggled so much with turnovers and they have struggled so much from a quarterback perspective, but the weapons are there. Charbonnet. Haskins, Patterson, they are able to hold on to the football. I'm worried that that has starts happening now. These receivers are able to make people miss in the open field. It's just about Patterson getting them the football. And so you look at this Michigan team that has struggled so badly against Wisconsin and so badly against Army, and you think, man, this just isn't the same Michigan team. But it's in there somewhere. And I'm very worried about this game for Penn State. I think they're going to win the game by about three to seven points. So I'm going to take Michigan to cover. I have Penn State winning the football game, but it's another grind it out, grit those teeth down to the bone, bite your nails type game. And I like a 23 to 17 mm. win for Penn State. Yeah, I, this is a tough one to call. I think eight and a half is very, um, very generous. I mean, Vegas must know something. Um, I, I think that it's going to come down to, as we already talked about, um, the defenses. Um, you know, Penn State should be able to stop their run. If they can make Shea Patterson throw the ball and beat him through the air, that gives Penn State a very good chance to win. Um, I think that the special teams are going to be very important, and Penn State's been playing pretty good special teams this year under the new coach, Joe Lorig, on special teams. I don't think Penn State is going to cover the spread. I think they're going to win. Um, I'm seeing 27-20 right now. Um, you know, maybe Michigan gets a, uh, as, as the betters out there like to call it a backdoor late touchdown type of thing that makes them cover the spread, um, or a field goal, whatever the situation may be. Um, I think it'll be 27, 20 in a, in a, I wouldn't say a low scoring game, but definitely not a high scoring game, an average scoring game. Um, I think that Penn state's a better team. So I think obviously that and being at home at night, um, coming off of a big win against Iowa, but. You just never know the emotions of these kids and who's going to show up um, any given day, and that's really what makes college football so great. Should be a great game. Christian, appreciate your time here, man. This was great. Thank you for uh, having me, Bob. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. Been, uh, a good one. Hopefully my picks kind of withstand, but I, I, don't, I don't Lots know. of pressure. Yeah, welcome to the cauldron. I'm actually debating them, but, you know, it is. It is oh, there's no turn back. You're good. <laughs> they're You're in. Good. They're locked. I they're locked. They're, in. they're good picks. <laughs> they were good picks. Good it picks. sounds like a tough week. Last week was a tough week. It was just a lot of last well, minute. Well, yeah, I mean, Arizona State, Washington State went down to the wire. Um, I'm trying to think what other. I mean, well, the Penn, Penn State, State spread two was. Two-point conversion away. Right. From, if, yep. Right, uh, you know your 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 boy O'Neill kind of helped you out with that one right there. Uh, <laughs> you could should have had a touchdown earlier, but you know, um, yeah, the games that we've been picking all year actually have been very good pick 'em games. We so. pay, what, what do you mean O'Neill helping me out? I picked Penn State to cover. <laughs> okay, whatever. But he's your boy. He's still your boy. But you didn't pick him to cover against. You did pick him too to cover against, against Buffalo. Pitt. Pitt. I'm telling oh, you. Oh, I thought you were talking about Buffalo. You're saying Chris. Chris picked Buffalo week. 
Okay. Well, we'll go back and review the and film. And they won against Buffalo with the oh, late okay. touchdown. Okay. All right. I may have been wrong, but we're going to review the but film. But we're anyway. going to have we're you do review. it at the beginning we're, of next week's we're gonna show. Re- when, yes. Yes. When yes. more people are watching anyway. So yeah, that should be fun. I look forward to that, okay. Tyler. I always appreciate your time. Great job. Great insight as always. Christian, thank you. Cool. Appreciated thank you your much. story and being able to tell it here on air, both Penn State and uh, your time with the Eagles. Thanks for those picks. And for all of our crew here at Bob Long Sports, I am Bob Long saying so long here from Bluebell. You are watching the Nittany Lions Sports Report here on Bob Long Sports. Have a great week, everybody. Enjoy the football, the whiteout, and the game day. And we'll talk to you next week. Take care.